behalf of the great, on behalf of the Bioproducts Institute and Eastman Chemical. And here we have this uh, possibility of starting an industry partnership and all starts with a dialogue. And this is what we have today. And I think this conversation can be quite interesting for uh, many of our students, undergraduate and graduate students, especially, uh, given that Eastman is uh, very active in hiring and, uh, and also in sponsoring projects of different levels. So from my past experience in NC State, I know they have maybe now for more than 10 years been sponsoring a lot of research in the area of cellulose, but beyond cellulose, including nanocellulose and others. So, it's an extremely important uh, uh, opportunity. So yo, I will just introduce the subject and then we go directly with Trevor Treasure, who we are very happy to host today. He will be talking uh, about himself a little bit at the beginning. So I'm not going to spend too much time introducing Trevor, but then he will be talking about the uh, background about Eastman Chemical, which is a, an amazing company. Uh, and he will be also talking about cotton I usually talk bad about cotton, Trevor, so I'm curious what you're going to say. I always say wood will replace cotton in the next generation textile. So let's see what you bring. Okay. And then we're going to have a, 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 Trevor will be talking or sharing with us opportunities for graduate students and also a poster uh, competition. And then hopefully we will have time for questions and answers. But before we start, and uh, for those of you in California, like Professor Yu Lossier in UC Davis, who is joining with her students today, as well as Trevor himself and those around the world, uh, here we always do before anything a land acknowledgement. And we would like to acknowledge that we are in, uh, gathered today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Muskiam, Squamish, Stolo, and, and uh, Sailwo two nations. So this is uh, very, in, very important to, to recognize where we are and um, the knowledge keepers where we live, the areas of the knowledge keepers where we live. And here is Trevor, and I'm, as I said before, I'm not going to, to talk a, 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 about, him, about him. He will introduce himself, but I have the distinctive pleasure just before coming, I check, to tell that um, I was a professor for Trevor when he was undergraduate student in a process design course in North Carolina State University. And, and do you remember what grade you made, Trevor? No, can't remember. It was a plus. All right. <laughs> Trevor is a study student, and since then he has an amazing career. Uh, he did uh, interesting research uh, in NC State in the Department of Forest uh, Biomaterials, and now he continues an, an amazing career in Eastman Chemical. So, uh, very much welcome, uh, Trevor. Super nice to reconnect with you and to learn about what you are doing. At the end, we're going to have questions and answers. Um, you can raise your hands at the end, but if you want to post uh, questions, you can do so in the chat. Maybe we can keep uh, this till the end uh, so that we don't have these uh, pop-ups uh, coming uh, all the time. So I think that would be the best way. And now I invite Trevor to start sharing the screen so to make sure that everything works okay. And uh, as I said before, Trevor will be uh, talking about uh, um, uh, cellulose esters and the story behind it in Eastman Chemical, that is, as I said, a true biorefinery located at least the main plant in, in Kingsport in Tennessee. And, and this is an amazing place to visit. So Trevor, uh, I think your screen is here now. And if you share full mode, perfect. So All welcome, right. Trevor. Floor is yours. All right. Yeah, thank you, Orlando, for that introduction. And you know, thank you to Richard and Kelly for help getting all the logistics worked out for us here. Um, yeah, so I've, I've prepared a conversation here. Uh, let's see here. I don't know if I want subtitles or not. Let's try exiting that. All right. There we go. Okay. Yeah, I got a presentation here. It's really got two parts to it. One's almost uh, really a history of Eastman Chemical with a a focus on our cellulose esters utilization and kind of the different type of products that Eastman has made uh, over the years. We just celebrated our 100th year anniversary here at the Kingsport site uh, last year. And 
2020. So a little bit of history there, because I know, yeah, some folks may not be familiar with Eastman and, and the types of products that we make utilizing cellulose. So that's, that's part of the conversation. And then on, there's a part of the talk that gets a little bit more technical. Um, and as an example of how Eastman uh, interacts with universities, um, and so we had done some preliminary research work on some cotton liners and looking at uh, better ways to characterize their purity. Um, and then we engaged with North Carolina State University to do some additional studies. So I'm gonna kind of talk about that body of work uh, as an example of the type of collaboration that we like to do with universities. Um, and then hopefully uh, an exciting announcement for some of the students at the end. So I'll try and keep this to 45 minutes and hopefully that'll give us time for some questions and conversation at the end. So start off with uh, there and back again. So I'm kind of a, um, you know, a Hobbit, Lord of the Rings nerd. So playing off of that a little bit, but yeah, basically talking about uh, the evolution of cellulose esters for more than a hundred years here at Eastman. Give a little bit of a personal introduction. Um, Orlando had put up there kind of my, my current job description, but I'll talk a little bit about myself and then some of the graduate work I did at NC State. And then we'll dive into the, the two different topics that I've already um, outlined for you guys. So personal background, I was actually uh, born and raised in the Southwest United States and uh, New Mexico. My father was career military and uh, worked at the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. So I spent most of my life out there, at least the beginning part. Um, brief stint living in Austin, Texas, which was a pretty fun town to, to live in during high school. But then North Carolina is really kind of my second home. It's where I finished high school, spent 10 years at NC State, uh, getting trained in chemical engineering forest biomaterials. Uh, but now I'm living in Tennessee, Northeast Tennessee, beautiful part of uh, the United States here in the Appalachian Mountains, uh, where our corporate headquarters is located for Eastman. Uh, I've got a wife, uh, Jessie. Uh, we've been together since we were 19 back at NC State. I actually met in bowling class uh, as one of the required courses as an undergraduate. And then I've got a son and a daughter, Ellis and Kenna. So as yeah, Orlando was mentioning, I got my undergraduate degrees in 08 uh, in chemical engineering and paper science and engineering. Uh, so a dual major program there at NC State. And then I guess I like the torture enough to hang out for an additional five years and I did a dual major PhD uh, between chemical engineering and forest biomaterials. And the, the topic of my dissertation is, is there. It's basically, you know, utilization, a lot of characterization work, but also uh, techno-economic modeling work um, around the use of lignocellulosic substrates, uh, mainly for energy at the time. There was a lot of money flowing for uh, second generation biofuels and things like that at the time. So. I didn't really know a whole lot about Eastman until I was in graduate school. And uh, we you know, funded a, uh, a graduate student research competition at the time. And I participated in that as did a lot of Orlando students back at NC State. And, uh, that was really my first introduction to Eastman. And after that, I got an internship. And that's really, uh, really the genesis for our graduate student internship program. It's grown over the years from that, but we like to bring in either master's students or PhD students to get some industrial experience here at our Kingsport site. And I've been with the company full time now since uh, 2014. And then in terms of interest, I'm a big car enthusiast. Uh, I actually uh, own a, a land speed record for a particular a class of racing that utilizes alternative fuels. So we actually made some cellulosic ethanol in the pilot plant there at North Carolina State uh, and used that fuel uh, to set a land speed record. So uh, these slides will be shared with everyone. And there, there's actually a YouTube video there. It's pretty entertaining going through kind of the steps in the pilot plant going from all the way market pulp to uh, purified liquid ethanol that we then used in uh, the race application. So that was a little bit about me. And then here's just a little bit about just the high notes from my dissertation work. You know, really the overarching goal at the time in the research group was to advance the, you know, both the fundamental, but also the practical knowledge uh, around the utilization of some of these lignocellulosic biomass streams uh, for either making sugars or materials. So, 
lot of training and process modeling and techno-economic analysis uh, modeling, which NC State has um, some experts in. But then on the fundamental part, uh, a portion of my work was trying to develop analytical techniques for doing spatial lignin distribution measurements on individual fibers. And we were really you know, trying to just subject uh, wood fibers to different types of chemical purifications and understand where the lignin was being taken out and uh, how that related to enzymatic hydrolysis efficiencies. And now we'll dive into uh, uh, first of the two main topics that we'll talk about this afternoon. That's the brief history of uh, Eastman and uh, cellulose esters here at the Kingsport site. Uh, so real quickly, uh, just a, a quick primer around uh, cellulose uh, ester chemistry, right? I mean, we're taking basically the opportunity of those alcohol sites, right, on the uh, anhydroglucose uh, unit to do chemistry on, uh, in a nutshell, right? And we're either substituting on acetyl groups or in, so, in some cases with some of our specialty mixed esters, combination of acetyl, propanyl, and uh, butyryl functionality onto the backbone of the, of the cellulose ester. And obviously this is all, depending upon what we substitute and the molecular weights on the, on the derivatives, you can have a, a wide variety of applications that these materials can go into from textiles to filters to uh, functional films and uh, displays to low molecular weight additives for uh, paints and rheology modifiers and uh, things like that. Um, you know, we don't substitute to our target degree of substitution right from the get-go. So a lot of uh, what we focus on is how do we get to a fully substituted triester cellulose uh, and do that efficiently? Because usually, I mean, in order to have a homogenous final product, we have to substitute all of the sites first and then carefully peel back some of the, the ester functionality uh, to get to the target degree of substitution, whether that's only with uh, cellulose acetates or our mixed esters. And really the, that really dictates the uh, final product performance and uh, polymer properties as well. Shown here is just uh, talking about, you know, some of the, the solubility and solvents that can just be used for uh, regular cellulose acetate, depending upon its uh, acetyl. <laughs> And as you can imagine, you know, having something that dissolves in acetone is, uh, has a much different fitness for use uh, uh, applications than, say, something uh, more difficult to deal with, like dichloromethane, right, at, at industrial scale. And then our process, because we are using, you know, a sulfuric acid catalyst to help drive these reactions, uh, and Mother Nature has the... Uh, the patent on producing molecular weight on cellulose, we're destroying that molecular weight as we try to do our uh, derivatization chemistry. So in some respects, it, it's a bit of a race, right? We're trying to fully substitute the cellulose while also preserving as much of the molecular weight as we can, or also targeting a specific molecular weight since that impacts uh, final product properties. So just a, a quick primer on what, uh, what the heck are cellulose esters? Um, but they can go into a variety of different applications, uh, depending upon what we do uh, chemistry-wise and molecular weight size. Right, getting into the, the his, history here. So this is really uh, pre-1920. Um, and the story of Eastman, you know, really began during uh, World War II, uh, when a lot of photographic chemicals got cut off from Europe, uh, where a lot of those bulk chemicals were being produced at the time. Uh, by the Germans because of the war that was going on. And uh, George Eastman uh, and a lot of American chemical companies that were relying upon uh, Europe for chem chemicals at that time, you know, looked for other options to try and uh, vertically integrate back into raw material chemical supply, uh, mainly to feed all the research and development and uh, production processes at the Kodak Park uh, site in Rochester, New York, which is kind of where Kodak was originally based. And really, the, the first application of cellulose acetate um, from Kodak uh, or Eastman Kodak came in around 1917, and it was used uh, to display cellulose nitrate uh, as airplane wing coatings. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, getting shot at uh, with nitrocellulose covering your airplane wings is 
uh, could lead to a, a fiery ball in the sky, right? And so that's often the case of uh, some of the growth uh, stories around cellulose acetate is its ability to substitute uh, and replace for uh, nitrocellulose applications and uh, a, be a safer derivative. And then at the end of World War I, like I said, you know, George Eastman, it was determined to vertically integrate uh, domestically into chemicals um, such that he would never get cut off uh, from supply again from Europe. And that's when Kodak purchased uh, basically an unfinished wood distillation plant that was left abandoned by the U.S. military at the end of the uh, World War I. And the military was siting this wood distillation plant in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains because of all the hardwood trees that were basically available, uh, as well as a, a nice source of uh, fresh water on the Holston River. So they had the same mindset, right, uh, as George Eastman did. They were just worried about chemicals for fighting a war, but the war ended. And so the distillation plant was uh, there, but not finished. And so George Eastman saw an opportunity to. Uh, vertically integrate. Um, and so they, they purchased the, the unfinished distillation plant and uh, got everything up and running by 1921. And so that's when the, the retorts and the wood distillation plant were completed, started up, and the first rail cars of methanol, uh, wood methanol, were shipped from uh, up to Rochester from Kingsport. And that's really the beginning of uh, the cutoff of chemical supply uh, between Kodak and Europe. Uh, 1925, so that I'm going to try and highlight some of the, the innovations that Eastman has gone through, especially kind of in the, the biomass utilization area over the, over the years. And one of the, the very first innovations was around what do we do with the residuals coming out of these wood distillation facilities, right? We're getting the, the wood alcohols and the, and the chemicals out of the wood, but we're left basically with a bunch of, you know, char that could be used for something, but we didn't know what. Uh, and so 1925, Eastman came along and uh, developed the charcoal briquette. Um, so a lot of people think that Kingsford maybe invented the charcoal briquette, but it was actually Eastman here at the Kingsport site. And that was used for a lot of different applications, you know, home heating, grilling, uh, and actually a pretty big market here in the Southeast US when the tobacco industry was big for drying and curing of tobacco. So charcoal was used for that application. Now I was alluding to earlier, you know, the, the growth of cellulose acetate really came um, from some of the safety deficits that nitrocellulose brings to the table, right? And so like 1929, for example, there was multiple cellulose nitrate film fires that caused many deaths uh, th uh, throughout throughout the world, you know, there was a bad one in, a, in an x-ray facility, for example, that killed almost 100 people. And so this really drew, drove the demand for cellulose acetate safety film. Um, but at the time, the volumes that were out there in the market, it, it wasn't really a, an economical investment for Kodak or Eastman to make. They needed a larger volume to get to the economies of scale that would be needed to do an investment for making cellulose esters. And that's when we really began a lot of research and development around yarn, films, plastics. Uh, and then also a lot of yarn dye research came out in the 1930s. And that's when Eastman recognized, hey, what, where are large volume uh, opportunities for cellulose uh, esters and particular acetate yarn to go into? And as you guys know, you know, the textiles industry is a you know, multi hundred million ton per year industry. And so that's really what the base load and the investment uh, justification was for Eastman to truly get into cellulose ester manufacturing at large scale and enabled the production of the safety film uh, products as well because we had the, the economies of scale. Uh, so the 1940s came around and uh, Eastman was actually asked to uh, participate in a variety of ways of helping the war effort uh, yet again. One was with uh, the production of hydroquinone at our Kingsport site. And basically that was very important because that's used as an arrester in the production of synthetic rubber, uh, which was being cut off from us uh, by the Japanese. Uh, a lot of the natural rubber at the time was coming from Asia. And so it's pretty important for us to be able to produce rubber to fight the war synthetically. Uh, RDX was produced at Kingsport site, which is a, 
uh, the most uh, high explosive material produced at the time. Uh, and we still have, it's not owned by Eastman, but it's, it's down the road, uh, a Holston Ammunitions Production Facility. And then Eastman, men and women, uh, scientists, engineers were asked to go down to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, which is about an hour and a half down the road. Uh, and a lot of isolation work, uh, radioactive components, right, that eventually made themselves into uh, the nuclear weapons that uh, ended uh, World War II. So Eastman operated uh, one of the um, centrifuge uh, operations there at Oak Ridge. So stepping in to, uh, basically post-war era, uh, the kind of the late 40s into the 50s, and we just had tremendous expansion of acetate yarn during those days. You know, it's very popular in the market. Uh, our yarn production facility here in Kingsport uh, employed 3,500 people, uh, and that was in the 50s. And in the 40s, uh, we actually started building our located in Longview, Texas, and really this and recognize, hey, in order to be diversified and profitable long term, we are going to have to get into the petroleum derived uh, raw materials stream. So polyester was coming on online then uh, and Eastman recognized, hey, yeah, well, we like our CEs and their applications, but we also need to grow and have this. And that holds true today. We still get a lot of petroleum our long fuse uh, and one of our big technology platforms is still polyester uh, especially co-polyesters as well um yeah so then the 1950s man, their cellulose acetate textiles began to kind of taper off you know for fashion reasons but also nylon came into existence and so eastman was faced with some fairly large starting to become empty and again, you know, we were we were looking for new applications for a cellulose ester, uh, and that's when uh, we developed uh, the filter uh, cellulose acetate filter toe for the tobacco industry, which uh, was quite profitable and a large volume for Eastman for many many decades, and is actually going away uh, as we get back into more textile applications. But then the other one that's very fascinating is bioplastics. So our our trade name for that is uh, tenite, but basically we're making a variety of different cellulose mixed esters, and we can use plasticizers with those materials and make uh, pretty tough bioplastic based things that go into things such as uh, screwdriver handles, you know, you, which you can whack with a hammer, uh, you know, as you're working on your car and things like that. Um, so uh, a uh, very cool invention, right? In the 50s, uh, a cellulose based bioplastic of which some people are still trying to, you know, strive to produce bioplastics today. Uh, I would be remiss uh, without mentioning our 1960 aniline plant explosion. Um, basically, we were doing some nitration chemistry at large scale and uh, um, basically some process parameters got out of control and there was a pretty large explosion at our Kingsport site. So I, like, I mean, I like to highlight that, that uh, a lot of the research and development in some of these areas is very interesting, especially at small scale. Uh, but yeah, we live in a world where, where we are having to produce things, things at large scale using fairly hazardous uh, chemicals. And uh, that, that was a dark day in Eastman's history, but we, we definitely learned a lot safety wise from that. And I think it's uh, impacted our safety culture moving forward. And yeah, in the 1960s, you know, polyester fiber continued to grow pretty strongly, and we built a tremendous amount of polyethylene terephthalate uh, plastic production facilities for bottle polymer all throughout the world. And Eastman engineered that process down to such a low cost uh, that we couldn't make any money in it anymore. And so we ended up getting out of the bottle polymer business eventually. So in the 70s, all the way to the 2010s, um, our cellulose acetate butyrate products uh, started to get into some of these very high value niche uh, coatings applications. Uh, so yet another example of, you know, a polymer when it's at high molecular weight can be used as, you know, a durable plastic. And then you say, take that same polymer, basically manipulate its molecular weight and all of a sudden it's it's great as an additive to automotive paint formulations that helps out with uh, 
uh, the orientation of metal flake and uh, just paint drying performance overall. So uh, that one's pretty interesting. <clears throat> and like I said, yeah, Eastman invented the bottle polymer in the, uh, in the 1980s, uh, working with uh, the soda industry. And then in the mid 1980s, kind of in response to the oil crisis that was happening in North America and what was going on in the, uh, the Middle East, Eastman decided, and this is a kind of a, a, a theme within the company, right? If there's external factors impacting our business that are out of our control, oftentimes we will look at integration opportunities. And this is when we really sunk a lot of research and development, as well as a tremendous amount of capital and money into developing gasification, in particular, uh, coal gasification for the production of acetyl chemicals. <clears throat> and then in 1994, Eastman officially separated from Kodak. You know, we kind of had two different visions of what the future looked like, and uh, it, it made more sense for the company to stand alone. I mean, still provide chemicals to Kodak, but it made sense to be managed as an independent company. In the 2000s, there was the digital transformation, right? And that opened up a whole new portfolio for applications on cellulose esters. So about this same time, right, uh, conventional photographic film uh, and triacetate applications were beginning to go away, right, as people were using more and more digital cameras. Um, and it was Eastman uh, looking out there for additional opportunities and applications where we started to get hooked up with the electronic films industry, right? and providing them triacetate films that go into uh, the panel making for uh, thin panel LCDs and even today with uh, uh, OLED type applications. And then of course, uh, you know, one of the big products, uh, I guess of the last 20 years that Eastman is pretty proud of is our uh, BPA free Triton co-polyester. Uh, that really made a, a dent in the market when the BPA scare really set in around 2008. And so we had that technology developed, but it was never really economic to deploy until we had that market driver. And so uh, that's been a very successful uh, product for us as well. All right, and then the last slide around uh, history. So 2011 and uh, leading up to today. So Eastman has been doing a fair amount of acquisition and growing. Um, so we've got organic growth, but also some inorganic growth, like our uh, acquisition of solution, all of their businesses, which they participate in. A lot of uh, functional film businesses, inner layers, like that go into laminated glass uh, in your automobile. There's laminated glass that has functionality to it, either for heads up displays or uh, heat and sound management. And so we participate in those markets as well as uh, sulfur markets uh, for uh, tire applications. In 2014, we kind of got into the, the amine chemistry markets through the acquisition of Tominko. Uh, so they have a lot of amine-based products, and we wanted to add that to our portfolio. Uh, and that goes into agricultural, animal nutrition, water treatment applications, things like that. And then in 2018, I would say there's really been a renewed focus on uh, how we're uniquely positioned from a sustainability point of view to participate in both the, the bioeconomy and the circular economy. And this is when we uh, reintroduce basically our cellulosic yarn uh, as Naya to the market. Um, it was different than the, you know, than the cellulose acetate yarn we were producing in the 50s just because of what the, the fashion industry uh, needs. But essentially it's a diacetate and we're just producing fibers of uh, different dimensions and things like that. Another technology that we're, uh, uh, using today is our carbon renewal technology. And this really is building off uh, a lot of our expertise in gasification. Uh, as you realize, you know, we built those plants to run off of coal, uh, but gasification is a wonderful technology for taking everything back to very simple components, right? Making syngas, uh, carbon monoxide, hydrogen. And you can do that with waste plastic as an example. And today we actually are processing waste plastics uh, that we've collected from different parts of the country through our gasification process. And so percentage of our uh, liquid chemical production is based from waste plastic. We also have uh, our polyester renewal technology where uh, we are building a $250 million methanolysis plant here at our Kingsport site, uh, which is going to be designed to take 
uh, polyesters, so waste plastic and break those back down into monomers. Uh, and then a lot of the challenges around cleaning up those streams such that we can make new co-polyesters from those monomers again. And so that, that's another investment kind of in the circular economy that we're uh, pursuing. And then on the cellulose ester front, there's a lot of activity looking at alternative sources of cellulose. You know, for the longest time, we've utilized either dissolving wood pulps that are very pure forms of cellulose or cotton liner pulps as our raw materials. Um, but we would like to, you know, see what the, the textile market really has an appetite for in terms of, hey, can you recover cellulose from a waste textile stream, for example, or does it make financial life cycle analysis sense to produce acetate yarn from a non-wood based dissolving pulp, for example. And so these are some of the questions that we're asking ourselves today. Um, but yeah, just uh, that kind of covers the history part of Eastman, um, but it, it's a pretty amazing site and amazing story that we've had over, over the hundred years. You know, I just hit some of the, the high notes, but I mean, going from basically a, a single unfinished wood distillation plant, right? Located on the river to a campus that's now more than a thousand acres and thousands of products. And uh, it, it, it's a pretty impressive site to see uh, as well as our corporate headquarters is located here in Northeast Tennessee. All right, so shift gears a little bit here on time. We're doing good on time. Uh, to talk about this uh, lint purity test development. And this is an example of collaboration that we did have with uh, the forest biomaterials department. And hopefully uh, get some of the, the students and faculty thinking about uh, maybe opportunities that we can some research projects. So just real quickly cover what is what are cotton linters, right? So human beings have been cotton for 7,000 years now, right, for textile applications and things like that. And that, that's been the primary purpose as to why we grow the crop, right, is to get the staple cotton for textile applications. Well, the cotton plant obviously, you know, produces seeds for reproductive reasons. And then the cotton linters are morphologically different than the staple fiber that's produced by the, by the cotton plant. And they're the more coarse uh, but very pure forms of cellulose that grow on the outsides uh, of the seeds, of the cotton seeds. And so there's a fairly mature market out there, uh, really developed by Procter & Gamble in their facility in Memphis uh, when they were in the edible oils market. But, you know, trying to understand what are the uses for that cotton linter, uh, it, it's kind of a byproduct because it's removed at the gems uh, when we're trying to get the good state. Uh, and then the linter is removed from the seed, typically at a uh, seed oil process. Because if you don't take the lint off of the seed, it reduces the yield of oil that you can get from a cotton seed. Uh, and so they like to strip that off so it's not soaking up the oil. Um, and so they were left with this stream, not knowing what to do with it. And that's where Procter & Gamble kind of developed the, the technology for purifying that stream and making a dissolving pulp stream out of it. But what's pretty amazing, a ton of cotton liner pulp that we would feed into our process, that's coming from roughly uh, planted cotton. So pretty amazing. I, I think I'll skip this slide, but basically this was just to give some perspective on how raw cotton linters are kind of processed and purified before a dissolving pulp user like Eastman actually utilizes them for making different types of derivatives. And it's very similar to, a, you know, the purification chemistry you would see at a, at a wood pulp mill. It's just there's not a giant chemical recovery cycle going because the amount of sodium that they typically use is much less and it doesn't make any sense to put in the uh, capital to recover that sodium. Uh, but a lot of the, the chemistries like in the bleach plant and things like that are the same as what you would use on wood pulp, just uh, different time temperature concentration uh, regimes. And talk a little bit about the sources of an impurities that can come in with these uh, cotton liner pulps. And really it, it's all the other parts of the cotton plant, right? That could potentially come along uh, for a ride with the good clean uh, cotton linter. In a vacuum, the cotton liner is 100% cellulose, right? 
but there's contamination from oil or from stocks or different parts of the cotton bowl uh, that even at very, very small concentrations even make it uh, into our uh, raw materials and we see it in our final products. But it's because of the demanding applications that our cellulose esters are going into that we need something as pure as a cotton liner pulp. Um, but yeah, just to highlight, a little bit different than wood fiber, right? The, the non-cellulosic uh, impurities in wood fiber are kind of uniformly distributed, you know, throughout each individual fiber. Whereas with cotton linters, you almost have a, a two populations, right? You've got your 99% of everything is nice, clean linters, and then sprinkled all throughout that is little bits of contaminants from other parts of the cotton plant. All right, so talk a little bit about why our uh, conventional purity measurements seem to fall short. Uh, so, you know, everyone's saying, well, why not just do normal wet chemistry measurements, right, on, you know, hemicellulose contents, for example, uh, in your cotton liner pulps. And we've, we've tried to do that. And kind of what's shown here in this figure uh, with some of the data redacted uh, so that I could share it with you guys is basically a relationship here on the y-axis of filterability. Uh, of a certain cellulose ester solution. So higher filtration is better. Uh, trying to look at that as a function of the amount of xylose uh, coming in with our raw material lens. And as you can see, we're at very, very low uh, xylose concentrations and uh, getting good measurements down at that level can be uh, difficult. And there, as you can see, the, the correlation here is not that great. You know, something loose, uh, but we wanted uh, to do something better. Another key point um, when it comes to hemicellulose is, is that, you know, a lot of their derivative forms uh, when you're trying to make esters do not play nicely with the solvents that work well for cellulose acetate or mixed uh, cellulose esters. They typically form insoluble gels and residues that end up needing to be either taken out by Eastman or taken out by our customers. And one thing we notice when we isolate these insolubles that are in our final products is that they're always enriched with hemicellulosa. So that's just a, a key point to uh, put out there. That's an example of a, an exercise where we isolated uh, some insoluble material from one of our triacetate products just to understand better hey, what kind of impurities are actually in there. And what we see is sometimes a just some amorphous gelatinous type material that's a mixture of you know, a cellulose acetate and a xylan acetate, but you often also see discrete particles as well that you can trace back to different parts of the cotton plant. So these uh, bright field optical images here are showing us actually pieces of the seed or fragments of a seed hole. And so that far right SEM there, that's the inside surface of a cotton seed shell. And so as those particles fall apart and make it into our pulp, this is what they look like in our, our final product. So the hypothesis at this point, um, you know, was that the impurities have a different aspect ratio compared to the good clean lint that was in our raw material that we were using for some of these high demanding applications. And how we kind of arrived at that initial hypothesis was with some preliminary work that we had done using a, basically a fiber quality analyzer. In this case, it was a Metso's FS5, but there's quite a few different suppliers as you guys know, but it's an optical flow cell based technique to get all the uh, statistical information around the uh, particle size distribution in a given slurry of fiber. Um, and basically what we saw and here, what I'm showing is basically a, a heat map of length versus width for two different types of cotton liner pulps. So shown on the left-hand side is what we see out of the fiber quality analyzer for a very high quality cotton liner pulp. And then what's shown on the right side of the figure is the same analysis, but for a low quality cotton liner pulp. And we know it's low quality because we've run it in our process and it produces significantly higher filtration loads in our customer processes as well. And so the thing that stands out, right, is there's a population of particles um, that is in the low quality cotton liner pulp that is not present in the high quality cotton liner pulp. And so that's really where that original hypothesis kind of came from was that, hey, maybe these are the bad actors really, right? But 
as you know, with these optical based flow cell techniques, it's not telling us anything about the chemical nature of those particles. It's just, hey, here's the size of some of these. But this was some uh, information that led us on to the, uh, an additional study. And this is when we started engaging with North Carolina State University with a technical service project where we basically used a Bauer McNett uh, pulp classifier to fractionate this stream into different length scales and then do chemical compositional analysis on those isolated streams based on size uh, in order to try and get better resolution on, hey, which one of these raw materials actually does have higher xylan content, for example, and where is it located? And so, yeah, just a, a kind of a pictorial of what we were hoping to get out of the study, right? Taking that population of particles, cutting it up better so that we could maybe get better discrimination and separation between a high quality cotton liner pulp and a low quality cotton liner pulp. So, yeah, again, this was a, a project we worked with uh, NC State on for about six months. Um, you know, we have projects that we've engaged with them on for multiple years and sometimes short term projects. So I want to make uh, faculty aware of that, you know, that we're open to all different types of collaboration when it comes to doing uh, research and development with academia. Uh, I don't think we need to cover too much about the Bauer mix. It's basically a liquid driven system, right, for uh, cellulosic fibers, which I'm pretty sure everyone's familiar with. Uh, like this. One thing that was a little bit different with this project is we actually went to the effort of collecting all of the fines, you know, which typically run to the sewer when you're with a Bauer McNett. But uh, as you can see, the guys at NC State uh, collected all of that liquid and then were able to isolate any of the particles that were in that fine stream as well for doing chemical composition analysis. And kind of cut to the chase, you know, about what we learned, you know, kind of the hypothesized results of what we were hoping to achieve on the right, uh, which I presented to you guys previously. And then here on the main figure on the left is looking at kind of the xylan content profile as a function of the fiber lengths coming out of the Bauer McNett uh, classification exercise. The individual data point shown here is just doing chemical compositional analysis on the raw material without any separation whatsoever. And as you can see, the, the difference between, you know, high quality and low quality, there isn't much. But when you do the separation, you know, you start to get a better picture of, hey, the xylan really, right? What, what uh, particle sizes are contributing to the impurity load? And it's definitely smaller particles, you know, fragments of different aspect ratio. Uh, and so the delta that we observed uh, wasn't 10% and 20%, but it was a 2x delta. I just, uh, uh, I wasn't allowed to share the actual absolute data here with you guys, but uh, we did basically confirm uh, some of the hypothesized results. Uh, let's see, some of the more details here. So I think I want to skip this part uh, so that we definitely have plenty of time. Only 15 minutes for that. Uh, so some concluding and you know, we've got quite a decorated uh, past and track record of innovation and utilization of cellulose uh, for some amazing applications, right? Uh, all the way going back to our first one of uh, painting, painting jelly cellulose acetate onto airplane wings uh, in place of nitrous cellulose, all the way up to uh, very uh, advanced applications today in automotive paints and optical film applications. And, you know, who, who knows what the next hundred years is gonna bring in terms of product evolution. Uh, some people get turned off by cellulose esters because of how mature of a material it is, uh, but I think there's a lot left to, to understand and a lot of additional application areas that could be explored with cellulose esters, as well as manipulating, you know, uh, basically partitions and, the, and then the makeup of these cellulose esters. Uh, I don't need to tell the, this audience this, but uh, in, you know we are dealing with a natural raw material, <laughs> right? Cotton liner pulp or dissolving wood pulps. You know, Mother Nature is making those for us, and we are trying to make very uniform, pure, final products for our customers. And so, how does Eastman work within that space to make our customers happy and to grow our markets, as well as you know minimize the amount of headaches that people like 
uh, me have to deal with on a daily basis as we're working with a, uh, a natural raw material. And so as we embark kind of on our, hopefully our next century of cellulose utilization, we're looking to grow our network. And really that was one of the, the main purposes for me, you know, reaching back out to Orlando and getting in contact with Richard is, uh, yeah, we, we know the expertise that is there on the West Coast. It's always been a, a little bit of a challenge, right, to get attention. Um, and so that we, this is the forum that we wanted to do this and begin that conversation. And hopefully we can get there. We know you guys are doing world-class uh, research, uh, you know, not just with cellulose, but lignin and hemicelluloses. And then another big part of uh, this initiative is around building a student to employee pipeline, like we currently have with uh, NC State. And that includes uh, internship opportunities. So within my uh, research and development group, we always have a either a master or PhD student uh, interning with us at any given time. We typically like to do those either in the fall or the spring semesters, as opposed to a short summer, just to give you know additional time for a student to get immersed in what industrial research and development looks like. Um, so that there's gonna be opportunities moving forward for doing that. We've already got all our spots filled for the spring of 2022, but definitely looking for people who may be interested in an opportunity like this for the fall of 2022. Uh, and then I'd also like to announce that we're gonna be funding you know, a poster competition uh, at UBC for the graduate students. And the details for that we'll, we'll probably put out early next year. I understand it's a, a pretty busy time of year with uh, uh, classes coming to an end and then the holidays and everything like that. So I think we'll, we'll kick that off uh, early next year and there'll, there'll be cash prizes uh, for the students who are participating and end up winning that competition. So it, this is kind of our, our first step you know, to hopefully start building a relationship with you guys. And uh, I look forward to some of the questions and discussion. I think I did reasonably well on time management Orlando. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where we sit. And I know that you, you had submitted a question. So we can touch on that first or uh, just pause and let, let some other folks ask some questions too. I'll, I'll let you moderate from here on out. Definitely. Trevor, you got an A plus today again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wonderful. And, and I think it's uh, really amazing to see the history because we can learn a lot about it and maybe project a little bit into the future. And, and we think, of course, that cellulose streams are super important in the future. And, and uh, now the, the floor is open for questions. You can raise your hand or you can put your questions in the chat and, and then we can uh, take it from there. But one question just to warm up that I yeah. wanted to, to, to ask is, is, is about the perception of uh, cellulose, especially cellulose derivatives mm -hmm. as the so-called bioplastics or yeah. biopolymers, right? And, and now in the EU, there is this single plastic, single plastic, single use plastics directives mm -hmm. that talk about having a modification of cellulose makes this no longer a biopolymer. And this is very important for your business and also okay. for our research here in campus, et cetera, right? So, I, I want to know what the position of Eastman is and, and how has been your participation in the discussion with the European uh, Union in this sense, because I yeah. think you, were, you have some voice there. Oh yeah, absolutely, Orlando. Yeah, that one's uh, an interesting, sensitive topic, right? And I think um, probably the best way to, to put things, especially in the circular economy world that we, we sit in right now, where there's a lot of focus around sustainability, is that the way that we study sustainability in an academic environment is a lot different than what's happening out there in the, uh, the capital markets, right? Where people are trying to sell products. And some of the, the regulation um, coming out of the EU around cellulose esters being classified as a plastic, right? As opposed to uh, a, a a biodegradable polymer, which it is, right? Cellulose esters will biodegrade in uh, various applications. Uh, I th has a lot of influence over where that cellulose acetate actually finds its application, Orlando. I, I, I think, you know, it's uh, cigarette filters, right? Is what is observable to a lot of those uh, legislative body makers. 
And even though the filter media inside those filters biodegrades, they don't biodegrade because of the, the wrapping actually that the filter is uh, wrapped up in. But it's a challenge and a, and a lot of that uh, can be driven by also some of the other uh, dissolving pulp users within Europe. You know, they, they've got a fair amount of influence as well. I'm, I won't mention any of the companies by name, but I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. And so the, they do have an influence there. And, you know, you were kind of alluding to uh, the use of cotton or the use of cotton byproducts in place of, you know, sustainably managed wood pulp, right? And there is a huge misperception out there in the market outside you know, an area of expertise uh, arena like we sit in, it's very obvious to us that, you know, if you're a good steward of the forest and you sustainably manage it, that oftentimes the cellulose that's coming from the forest carries with it the lowest environmental burdens associated with it. But then when you start moving to substituting some of that, that's where the life cycle analysis exercise starts to become very important. Um, and what we have come to learn is that it's very much a customer by customer basis in terms of what is actually important to them when we do our life cycle analysis. Uh, oftentimes people new to the field are only concerned about carbon, for example, right? But uh, if you only look at carbon, dissolving wood pulp and a cotton liner pulp look pretty similar, right? Because they're both uh, biogenic carbon sources that have been sequestered out of the atmosphere. But then when you start looking at the other environmental burdens associated with cotton production in comparison to, you know, a naturally regenerated forest, that's where you can start to see some uh, big discrepancies and some of uh, But, you know, sometimes the customers don't care about those things. They're only focused on carbon, you know, from a marketing perspective. And I think that's going to be one of the big challenges for scientists in this area as we try to influence where humanity is going right to use some of these natural biopolymers is getting past some of these misconceptions that i hate to use the word greenwashing you know but is somewhat wrapped up in that and it's a it's a misunderstanding by the general public so i'll pause there uh, yep. <laughs> just some thoughts but yeah, Thank no, you, I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's tough and you know definitely our a lot of our suppliers right now are, see a lot of frustration because the pulp and paper industry, you know, has has striven for many, many years to have sustainably managed wood pulp uh, supplies. And so now they're basically being saying, hey, you know, maybe using the forest isn't such a good idea. And so th there's a fair amount of, I think, healthy debate going on in this arena right now, but it, it needs to be science based, right? And we need to be looking at data and having conversations about based on data and not necessarily feelings right like hey you're mowing down the forest or you know what is happening to our landfills and things like that yeah great trevor thank you for your insights uh, this is of course uh, uh, many many points there are many points there up to debate but uh, this is an ongoing conversation that we all need to be aware of and and get a little bit of documentation to to make a point right so i appreciate your point of views yeah, sure. uh, um, uh, Amanda has a question. Amanda, I, I asked short questions so that we can also get uh, short answers and we cover as many as possible. So Amanda, why don't you jump in? Uh, thank you, Trevor. I, I had a question about your CLT correlation between uh, fiber length and xylan content. So okay. you showed that there was this correlation in your low quality CLT where shorter fibers seem to have a higher xylan content. So mm -hmm. what's going on there? Uh, what's going on there? Is the xylan sticking to the shorter fibers preferentially? Or are these actually fibers or might they be xylan aggregates or particles? And mm -hmm. do you think lignin's involved perhaps? Yeah. Um, yeah, so they are, they are more lignocellulosic fibers coming from different parts of the cotton plant, basically. Or... They could also be just different um, morphological features of the cotton plant in general, like seed hole fragments and things like that, you know, that on the FQA show up as pretty small finds, but they're also heavily in, enriched in uh, xylan. And really the reason for that is um, how they do the purification on the cotton liner pulp. You know, they're, they're predominantly focused on making sure that the lint portion gets cleaned 
of, yeah, as much as they can, the hemicellulosis and the lignin uh, that may be present in there. And so, yeah, it's, it's more of a uh, inherent, I guess, particle size and where that is coming from in the cotton plant that's kind of draw, uh, driving a lot of this uh, correlation um, here. And then lignin, um, <laughs> funny term. I don't, I don't know if I would really call it lignin at this point, but there are uh, aromatic type moieties left still, even in these raw materials that we can detect through uh, like fluorescence microscopy as an example. So yes, definitely uh, lignin can play a, a role or lignin moieties can play a role as an impurity. Typically, they're present at, you know, an order of magnitude or more uh, lower than like the hemicellulosis. So we typically uh, focus on the hemicellulosis more so than the lignin. But yeah, we do have data and analysis to suggest that there is, you know, some fluorescence interactions going on there and so some lignin moieties. This is a very important topic, actually, very, very timely uh, related to the use of uh, such fractions in many applications where really the chemistry is not really easy to access. Mm -hmm. And uh, wonderful job. And, and uh, one comment here is the fact that you, what you are doing to, to cotton is pretty much the same challenge we have when we're treating uh, hemp or or residuals, uh, think about food losses and waste that in the future will be very important resources for us. And mm -hmm. the issue of separation will become more and more relevant in the future. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great. Uh, Scott, you have a question, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for the nice uh, seminar and the overview of everything that Eastman has contributed to over the years. I was curious in terms of um, your PET bottle example. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm wondering in today's climate, so 2021 with the focus on the circular economy, uh, is there any type of, um, I guess, design uh, guidance or mandate from Eastman to basically look into uh, uh, basically disposal of, of the materials and collection and then recycling? I know you mentioned your um, methanolysis and mm -hmm. gasification. But uh, are you at all mandated from a company standpoint to actually, okay, now let's go ahead and um, look actually how to close, close this circle? Or is yeah. it still, once you sell the material, it's no longer your responsibility? No, that's a yeah, great question, Scott. And a very important point that we're facing at Eastman right now is we try to participate more and more in the circular economy and you know, utilizing waste streams as raw material streams. Um, we're not legislated, I would say, into uh, uh, doing some of those activities, um, but we see it as a very important from a long-term growth perspective. But one of the kind of chicken and egg situations we find ourselves in, especially thinking about industrial scale, is the supply chains. I mean, they do not exist today. Right, and that's something that uh, we are sh struggling with. And Eastman, you know, is participating in helping to develop some of those supply chains, right? Because, you know, waste is a, is a very diffuse thing, right? Unlike uh, the head of an oil well, <laughs> right? Where all of your crudes coming out at one single geographic location uh, with like waste plastics, for example, right? That's scattered in the wind. And then how do we, manage that, uh, particularly in North America, you know, and get plastics better separated so that they can be uh, reused. And then also in textiles, um, we try to talk with a lot of our customers around designing their garments for recyclability at the get-go, right? Uh, I, I gave the example of us trying to look at, hey, can we utilize the, uh, the cotton cellulose portion of textiles? Uh, for making new cellulose ester derivatives well that gets very difficult when you've got a mixed garment right that's either you know half cotton half polyester or if you've got elastane in there and polyamides and things like that and so these are incredibly difficult technical challenges for you know chemists and engineers to try and deal with when you think about enabling a, a circular solution it, it it's a great marketing story, you know, but uh, 
technically doing some of these things is incredibly challenging. Yeah, and so in terms of uh, the methanolysis plan, that's absolutely true. We are having to develop supply chains ourselves in order to ensure that we've got enough waste plastic raw material in it in order to uh, feed that plant. And I'm hoping, um, as much hope as you want to put in governments, <laughs> that you know we'll, we'll start to get some support. I think the broader public is going to have to shoulder some of the costs in this, this economy, right? Whether they want to or not, if this is really the direction that uh, mankind wants to go. So yeah, it's a, it's a big problem. I mean, it, it just basically does not exist today you know, the logistics and the supply chains around a lot of these waste materials. Great. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, we're yeah, about the hour now. And uh, okay. Scott, you, yeah, Scott, go ahead. If you wanted to close. Uh, I was just saying, <clears throat> thank you. So gr great answer. So I appreciate ah, it. Sure. Yep. Great. I had some questions about solvents and the use of water. There are very important topics, but I will keep this for the, for the next uh, occasion. And, and okay. maybe before we close, I will give a chance to uh, Chokof, Chokofe who uh, raised her hand. So may maybe you can go ahead and, and we will keep this uh, for a min minute or so. So Hi. Go ahead. Yep. Go ahead. Hi. Um, excuse me. I have a question about the process of uh, uh, you use to produce uh, pulp. Uh, you use uh, soda, I think, with an uh, a O H, but I want to know: Have you uh, searched about some kind of uh, more environmental friendly process, like um, um, you know, like uh, gamma valerolactone or another um, process like that, organosulf process? I mean, or do you have plan to research about this kind of uh, process in future mm -hmm. for? your uh, company? Yeah, yeah, good question. Because I think there are opportunities, uh, especially as you look at more and more non-wood feedstocks, you know, like Orlando was alluding to with uh, hemp or other agricultural byproducts and things like that, for us to look at, yeah, other chemistries for doing delignification or hemicellulose removal. Um, we have not looked at you know alternative chemistries to kind of conventional alkaline based lignification chemistries for cotton liner pulps you know that's been kind of the i guess the the legacy process and the, the hammer if you will for uh, saponifying the oils and trying to get uh lignin uh, out of uh the raw linter stream and things like that but that's certainly you know, a topic that is going to be covered in the, uh, the SAFI consortium that's being managed at NC State and, uh, you know, UBC and the Bioproducts Institute is a member of that as well. So, yeah, we're going to look at that. I mean, um, maybe for some of these futuristic plants where you're, make, you know, utilizing the biopolymers from non-wood feedstocks. Yeah, maybe, you know, inorganic based pulping chemistry to, is not the right choice. Or... You know, in the case of Eastman, for example, if we were to co-locate a processing facility at our Kingsport site, there's a lot of integration potential specific to Eastman, right? And a lot of different solvents that we have access to and uh, recovery systems that are already in place. And so, yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. I think an area of uh, research that could deserve a little bit more attention and we'll be getting some, at least with our, you know, the consortium that we're participating in. Excellent. Thank you so much, Trevor. I think uh, we are a little bit above the hour and sure. maybe it's a good time to finish at this point. I, I yeah. think this is a great conversation and we will continue, Trevor, and um, we will have the poster competition coming and, and yeah. of course, uh, more engagement with the researchers, uh, with professors and myself. I learned today a lot, uh, that interaction between, between industry and nature and society, and the, we can learn also a lot from, from the history, right? And, and that was really very good pitch. So we appreciate this very much, Trevor. And um, with that, I think we should close now. I will, I will make uh, available the presentation that you share with us um, in a PDF that Kelly uh, will be distributing to those who register. And uh, we will keep the conversation, Trevor. Yep. So super happy to close uh, with this uh, high note. Thank you so much, Great. Trevor. Yeah, thank you, Orlando and Kelly and Richard. And yeah, anyone else on the on the call, please feel free to reach out to me via email. You know, if it's 
you know, something related to cellulose or related to polyester that can help, uh, you know, get, get people connected and, you know, see if there's opportunities for us to collaborate. Wonderful. So, yeah, Big appreciate it.